Hello, how are you doing? Uh, we're here at the University, uh, Catholic University in Argentina, and we are so happy to be here with uh, some of the professors and people who work at the university. Uh, today, we are visiting Argentina. My name is Jimena Murillo. I'm originally from Bolivia, but I've been in Houston for many years. I lead a nonprofit organization uh, that promotes uh, social justice and uh, promotes peace as well. Uh, we work with different uh, communities around the world, uh, communities at risk, communities that are marginalized. And one of the uh, programs that we have in Argentina is with the Aboriginal uh, communities in Jujuy. So we are back from Jujuy, and here we brought um, our mentor, is the mentor of the organization, United for Change Center. Uh, we also do a lot of research, uh, Dr. Bob Reed, we do a lot of research in terms of philanthropy, and today we want to talk about philanthropy. Uh, we know, we understand that the terminology uh, is different and the approach is different in Latin America uh, compared to the United States, but today we're going to learn uh, how, we, uh, how we view philanthropy and what philanthropy is in the United States and compared to the rest of the world. Uh, so thank you both for being here today. Um, uh, me and Magdalena are going to ask you some a couple of questions. But first, can you introduce yourself? We know that you play a lot of roles uh, uh, with the NGO, the uh, United for Change the organization, but also with your own expertise uh, among many uh, careers that you have, uh, that specifically to philanthropy. Can you share uh, first introduce yourself, and then we have to start with the questions. Thank you, Jimena. Yes. Um, so I am a philanthropic scholar. I research philanthropic practice, um, and I share my results with um, universities, uh, with foundations, uh, with foundation associations on multiple continents. Um, we have published a series of articles in academic journals on philanthropic practice. I have a faculty appointment at the School of Medicine at the University of New Mexico, uh, where I work with others to help uh, develop uh, initiatives to improve social determinants for uh, people relative to healthcare, because research tells us that somewhere between 15 and 30% of our physical well being is derived from medical delivery. The rest are from social determinants, and they are things such as uh, food insecurity, uh, education, uh, uh, various uh, home insecurity, other kinds of factors that more directly influence our physical well-being. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, I also have a research advisory firm called Edge Philanthropy, <clears throat> where we conduct research and we advise foundations in different locations on a range of topics, including governance, management, investment management strategies, because these are endowed organizations, uh, grant making strategies for a variety of different issues, from social justice issues to community and economic development to education, pre-K through high school and higher education, uh, to arts and culture, to animal welfare, and environmental issues. Um, so, uh, those are that's my background. That's great. So, you know, as you, you were mentioning uh, all the research that you've done in philanthropy, um, what what is the approach of philanthropy in the United States compared to the rest of the world, spe specifically to Latin America? Well, first of all, let's let's talk about the scale. Uh, and, and the age of philanthropy. <clears throat> Some countries have a much longer history uh, in philanthropy than the United States does. I, uh, a couple of years back, was presenting in London to the Association of Charitable Foundations and I met with foundations that their charters date back to the 1500s and 1600s, where they were concerned about the effect of pirates uh, on the well-being of people. They've been around a very long time. Uh, but because of the 
scale of uh, the economy of the U.S. being the largest economy in the world, uh, <clears throat> and a certain social policy that exists within the United States, the United States has the greatest amount of philanthropic assets compared, in fact, it has more assets than um, institutional philanthropy has in the rest of the world combined. But it is still very much an experiment. Philanthropy in the United States legally only goes back 130 years. In addition to that, um, just over 70% of the foundations in the United States have existed for 15 or fewer years. So this is a brand new field. It, it comes out of a social contract uh, between the government of the United States and families of high wealth. Uh, in exchange for these families uh, making a perpetual, irrevocable commitment of certain financial assets to philanthropic benefit, they get to maintain and control their foundations in perpetuity without outside control. They merely have to follow certain regulations, certain um, guidelines. For example, they can only make grants to qualified nonprofits. Their grants have to have charitable purpose. They have to uh, uh, watch their transactions with family members so that the money goes to charitable purpose rather than to other purposes. Um, and so there are a series of regulations that they submit to. But it is still a brand new field. There are some people, uh, perhaps uh, you've heard of the economist Robert Reich at uh, Stanford. He's a very big critic of philanthropy in the United States. He thinks it would be far more efficient to take the money that goes into these foundations and give it to the government and the go allow the government to redistribute that wealth for a greater, more efficient effect. <clears throat> One of the things we found in our research is that efficiency and effectiveness are not necessarily the same ideas. They can actually, you can have an organization that is highly efficient but not very effective. Efficiency just has to do with uh, how expediently you're able to do something. But was it the right thing to do? Um, you know, was it the right strategy? Did it have the, the kind of impact. We're going to talk tonight to a local Rotary group about the difference in part of many things that we're going to talk about of effectiveness versus efficiency. Sometimes effectiveness is not very efficient, what it takes to be effective. So the idea of private philanthropy in the United States is to have kind of a thousand points of light, to have all of these entrepreneurial organizations that are seeking to address challenges in society. Uh, poverty, uh, illness, uh, economic isolation, uh, uh, racial injustice, uh, a variety of things that uh, are difficult to the fabric of society, but to do it in innovative and new and different ways. We think of these as being social entrepreneurs. So what's an entrepreneur? You know, we think of entrepreneurs in terms of business constructs and having graduated from four business schools, I tend to think of entrepreneurs in that way. But what entrepreneurs are, are people who innovate, who color outside the lines, who look for different kinds of solutions to things. And so we have 100,000 foundations in the United States that are all going in different directions. They're looking for different solutions. Uh, now, there, there is a, they have a trillion dollars in assets. And I don't know about you, but that sounds like a lot of money to me. That would fund my retirement very handily. But those assets combined to the organizations they're intended to serve, which is called the third sector. You have the, the private sector, you have the government sector, and then you have in the middle the third sector, which are social welfare organizations. Turns out that in the United States, found the foundation assets are only three quarters of 1% of the assets of that third sector that they seek to influence. So while there is a lot of aggregate money, in reality, they're not the, the flea trying to wag the dog, the tail on the dog. They're the embryo in the flea trying to wag the tail on the dog. So foundations are really relatively 
minuscule in the context of the sphere that they operate within. So what we're seeing as we talk to foundations, for example, in Australia or in uh, the United Kingdom or the United States, or even the limited foundation existence that we see here in Latin America, because there is not the same kind of social contract that spurs the development of private foundations here that there is in the United States, is that if you know one foundation, you know one foundation. You cannot say all foundations are similar in how they do things. They are terminally unique. So I think philanthropy, where it is largest, is at this moment an experiment in public policy. Time will tell. I'm, I'm pretty optimistic from the research that I've done that foundations are doing some work that is much greater than the assets that they have. But they're like any other sector. There are good players, and there are less than good players, right? So um, when we talk to you know, foundations sometimes here in, the, in, in Latin America, sometimes what we mean by a foundation is a nonprofit organization, yeah. Yeah. not necessarily an endowed uh, institution that is making grants to other nonprofits. So it's the definition is different here than it is in the United States. Uh, in the United States, to be a foundation means that you have a certain amount of assets that you perpetually invest, and you then turn around and you uh, make grants for 5% or more of your total assets every single year. The amount of distribution required for private foundations varies according to where you're at. In, the, uh, in Canada, it's 3.5%. In Australia, it's 3%. In the United Kingdom, it's 0%. They, the government requires zero distribution of those foundations to charitable purpose. But what we've learned is that does not adversely affect the distributions that are made for charitable purpose. To the contrary, what our research has found is, is that people by and large, who are involved in private foundations are very enthusiastic about having an impact. And so they distribute more than the amount that is actually required of them to distribute because they are enthusiastic about the opportunity to have an impact. So that's some of the contrast that sets the, uh, the stage for the scale, the newness of the field, uh, what's going on in the United States versus what's going on elsewhere. Perhaps you'd like That's to move great. into um, to another question. Yes. yes. So there, this is a very fascinating uh, topic, you know, because we're talking about something new, but also that has been evolving. So we found, in terms of uh, age, and then I'll give you the, the, uh, the other question. But in terms of our audience is, is a young audience. Mm -hmm. lovely. So how uh, has been changing? Uh, how philanthropy has been changing for young generations? How they they see uh, you know. So that's moving in a different direction. Uh, and I delivered a keynote speech at Purdue University uh, this last year on this very issue. Because what you're really asking me, I think, is within the institution of philanthropy, how are rising generations changing behaviorally? And this is really important because I just said that in the United States, foundations have a trillion dollars collectively in assets. What I didn't tell you is that the intergenerational wealth transfer that is happening in the next two decades is expected to move that from one trillion to twenty-six trillion dollars. So philanthropy is is, is ready to to rocket into a new dimension of existence, but it's going to be handed to a new generation. People of my generation like to give uh, philanthropic gifts to big international nonprofits like the Red Cross, Salvation Army. They, they, you know, if, they, if, they, if they saw maybe there was a hurricane or a fire or some other kind of natural disaster, that they would give money for that purpose. That, that's what I would call in my language as being arm's length philanthropy. It, you're, you're not connected to the work of the philanthropy, you're merely trying to put money into good purpose and good organizations. And that has existed for a very long time. Uh, I've 
we have interviewed uh, rising generations, and I'm not going to worry about whether they're Generation Z, Generation Y, or X. It doesn't matter. It's, it's the rising generation. It's the generation that will receive custody of these foundations. They look at philanthropy very differently. Um, they want, uh, they, they don't, don't always even think in, in traditional terms of uh, institutional philanthropy. There, there are new institutions called B Corps that do philanthropic uh, kinds of work. We're seeing family offices created that make grants out of family offices rather than foundations. There are other kinds of uh, philanthropic entities. Uh, the Zuckerbergs, don't, they, they don't have a nonprofit foundation. Uh, they have an entity that they service as a foundation, but it's actually not nonprofit. Creative yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, what we've learned as as we've interviewed we've interviewed peop young people from Europe, from Africa, from South America, and from the United States, and we're finding something very consistent. It's fascinating. Uh, these young people are wanting to shake things up. Um, and we're seeing this culturally. They, they arrive younger and more prepared to take on more responsibility with higher expectations that they're going to be in a position to take on these responsibilities. Um, this may be the smartest generation ever in some ways. And they're, they don't understand why they're being held back. They need to, they need, give me the position now. I want to do this. But when they practice philanthropy, they want to marry three, the three T's, their time, their talent, and their treasure. So for example, um, I um, was flying from New York to Boston, sitting next to an accountant. And I was talking to this young accountant who had just performed an audit on a business in New York City. And she was telling me that her young partner was going to Tanzania uh, the next week. Um, because she goes every year, and that's what she does for her vacation. She takes the money that she has, she goes to Tanzania, and she provides microloans mm -hmm. to women. And then, but as a condition of those microloans, they have to then uh, take her business consulting. And she's very good at this. They shouldn't charge anything for it, but they have to participate in that. So she has a very kinetic relationship to her philanthropy. She wants to reach out, feel, touch, see the effects. So I said, great, when is she going to be there? I was going to be in Tanzania the next week too. So we met her for lunch, had lunch with her, and interviewed her to find out what she was doing. And she talked about the struggles that she was working through with these women who were trying to develop their own businesses in Tanzania. That's an example of the rising generation, and how they practice philanthropy differently. Remember I said that my generation practiced a lot of arm's length, more transactional uh, philanthropy. These new, this new generation is more relational. But they're not, that doesn't mean that they're not strategic. They're very strategic. I actually think that philanthropy may advance very significantly as a consequence of the transition in generations because of the expectations these young people have on these institutions of philanthropy, that, they, that they're not just simply sitting back and operating under these elaborate uh, theories of change and social models. They want to see where they're hitting the ground. They want to work on the grass level. Now, one of the things that's important to say because we all know about the big foundations like the Gates Foundation or Kellogg or the Ford Foundation, these mega foundations. What's important to know is that just over 90% of the foundations in the United States only have $10 million or less. These are very small organizations. If you have a $10 million foundation, you're probably only making grants each year of about $500,000 to $550,000. Now, this still sounds like a lot of money, but not when you're trying to pursue social change and social benefit. So by being able to marry up their time so they're engaged themselves, their talent, so they're doing philanthropy in areas they have skills. For example, this woman who was an accountant 
who was doing business development with women in Tanzania. The leverage for the funding that she was able to make available made the effect of her work much greater than the amount of money that was involved, right? And so that's what this next generation is doing. That's where they're going with this. I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about the, the role of universities in philanthropy in the U.S. So right now there is only one school of philanthropy in the United States, and it's at Indiana University. Um, it's the Lilly School of Philanthropy. But there are many other universities that are beginning to develop uh, programs to train staff to work in these foundations. Some are developing programs to train families to be able to oversee and govern their foundations. Um, and so there, there are all these green shoots, but universities have not, by and large, yet embraced this idea of training people for private philanthropy. And yet, I just shared with you the example of that in the United States alone, and the United States is not the only part of the world that's going to have you know, an unprecedented intergenerational transfer of wealth. The, the countries around the world are also going to have this. So I think there is a huge opportunity within uh, academia to reach out, support, and grow philanthropic activity. But it's going to be interdisciplinary. So sometimes we see uh, philanthropic programs developing out of business schools. Because why? Well, uh, the investment management side requires business discipline. Uh, the governance and management requires uh, that. But we all, we're also seeing other uh, fields interested in philanthropy. Uh, my position at the School of Medicine uh, is based on my research in philanthropy. So they are interested in philanthropy. Uh, we're seeing uh, uh, programs develop out of uh, the social sciences, uh, psychology, uh, sociology, social work, uh, but they're not yet formalized in a significant way. What I think is going to happen is because of this rampant growth in philanthropy, there's going to be, need to be a variety of continuing education kinds of programs, formal education programs, uh, a variety of educational offerings. And the universities that do that the best are going to end up serving uh, families of uh, high net worth and the families that are providing governance to uh, philanthropy, and as a result, are probably going to benefit handsomely from the grant making of those foundations because of the relationship, the deep relationships that get developed. We're already starting to see that at the one school of philanthropy in the United States the Lilly School, that um, a number of philanthropic private foundations are rallying around that school to try to fund what they're doing. But that school, it's an excellent school, and they're doing some great work, but they're largely focusing on public policy rather than on training the um, families and the people who will uh, work in these foundations. Uh, we are talking right now about writing a book on family philanthropy uh, based on, we, we have a very substantial amount of data uh, on probably now 150 foundations. And one of the chapters we intend to title, uh, Pursuing a Career in Somebody Else's Living Room. There is nothing more um, tangential. Uh, than working in philanthropy uh, and vicarious. Because uh, if you work in philanthropy, as I do, and I led a foundation for 26 years, uh, everything you're proud of, somebody else did. You might have provided the funding, you might have seeded some ideas, but the nonprofit you funded actually carried out the work. They achieved the outcome that you're proud of. If you're staff and you're not family, you're carrying out the interests, the concerns, the values of the family, not necessarily your own. So 
you are vicariously living through the family, and you are at the same time vicariously living through these nonprofits that you fund. So it's a very different kind of work that needs a lot of study. Uh, because uh, once you go to work for a private foundation, because of the, the resource disparity that exists between a resource-seeking nonprofit organization and a resource-intense grant-making organization, uh, resource dependence theory tells us that uh, you have an unequal level of power. Okay, um, Because why? Well, the foundation could decide who it's going to fund, the terms of which it's going to fund, and how much it's going to fund. And so we, we often say that if you go to work for a foundation, uh, you live in an artificial bubble. Uh, the jokes you tell are considered the funniest jokes that people have ever heard. Uh, the coffee's always hot. The carpet's always red. You know, people are happy to hear what you have to say. They think it's the smartest thing they've ever heard, even if they don't agree with it, right? Because they're afraid to say, that I don't think I agree with that because it might diminish their chances to get a grant, right? So um, it, th there is a lot of work that needs to be done on teaching people how to navigate that environment, how to stay humble, mm -hmm. uh, to understand you do represent the interests, the values, the concerns of a family, but you also are seeking to empower uh, these nonprofits mm -hmm. to not be more powerful than but to actually give them the power. Um, the object of grant making is to empower organizations. But the moment money gets involved, it disempowers people, right? So this is an area that we're going to have to borrow from social work. We're going to have to borrow from psychology. We're going to have to borrow from business. And we're going to have to prepare people to work in this field in a way where they understand what is your responsibility? What is your role? What is the role of the family that is governing this and from which the funds have derived? What is your role relative to the nonprofits? Uh, and so universities are going to have to play a big role in this. Wonderful. One last question. Mm -hmm. You're an expert in philanthropy, but you're also a philanthropist. And you dedicate your time, your treasury, your efforts to be there in, 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 in the place you know, where the project is being done. What was your experience in Argentina so far mm -hmm. and, and working with these communities? Well, first of all, uh, this is my first time to Argentina. I've been many times to South America, but it's my first time to Argentina. And I have fallen in love. Uh, Argentina is a wonderful country. Uh, Buenos Aires is a place I would love to live. Uh, and I live in a beautiful place in New Mexico. But this is unbelievable. It's alive. It's, you know, I love New York City. I love this better. Uh, Hujuy, where we just spent time, was wonderful. It's as different from Buenos Aires as Argentina is from the United States, because you have uh, a, a higher level of poverty, you have a higher level of indigenous population, rich culture, but all kinds of challenges. And uh, as I got the opportunity to interact with the people who were beneficiaries of the program you're talking about, they were wonderful. They, these were people who, and I've traveled the world in philanthropic projects. And what I've learned is cultures vary, nationalities vary, governments vary, policies vary. But people are the same. That what they want is the same. They want health, happiness, and security for themselves and their families and their, their communities. Um, and we've seen that over and over and over again. And when they are hopeful, when they see opportunity to be hopeful that they can now provide for their families, you see a spirit of generosity that is unparalleled. Um, and so uh, the people of Argentina are wonderful. Uh, I, I've, I could easily spend a lot of time. We were at the National University of Hui uh, yesterday meeting with uh, several deans. And um, I love being in a university setting. Uh, I, I speak at universities all over the world, and, and I, 
I love universities. I love places of learning. But the setting that this is, that your university is in, that this Buenos Aires is magnificent. It's an incredible place. Well, thank you so much, Bob. If anyone has another question, Natalia. Perfect. No, thank you so much, Bob. Thank you for being here. It's been a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to be here.